Good morning, and welcome to uh, Sunday, as we have gathered here today to worship and also uh, to spend some time in, in study in our Sunday school classes, but also to spend some time in fellowship today uh, with the Lemonade on the Lawn activity after this service and before Sunday school commences. Um, you all know me well enough, we'll, we'll get through on time, so we'll have some time to fellowship. First thing I wish to do, to do today is thank <clears throat> Christy and Tara and all the youth for their, uh, their work this past week in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, I have just had an opportunity to speak briefly with Christy and Tara, and they both have said they had a, uh, a meaningful and purposeful week in Alabama. Uh, the weather was cooperative. <clears throat> and, we, and we thank you, uh, for your leadership and dedication and acknowledge that, but also wish to express our appreciation to the youth if you would uh, carry that forth for the church. Reverend Witchwine is in Ohio uh, where he is conducting a uh, funeral service for one of the family members that passed back in December. So this was something that was scheduled, uh, obviously because of COVID. So he is there. He's also taking some time uh, to do a little vacationing and work around the house and all the things that you would do if you, you'd been away from your home for a while. <clears throat> I would like to take this opportunity to briefly update all of you on the progress with the IPM process as we evaluate ourselves while looking forward to finding a new resident or senior pastor. The search committee and the transition team have been informed that we're looking for someone that basically matches the core beliefs of this church, uh, which are found in our church constitution. We're not rewriting the constitution and all that kind of stuff. But our core beliefs basically are focused in the scriptures, uh, the Reformed Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, and all of these uh, things that we believe in the church, obviously you can find the document that's been floating around for years called uh, We Believe, This We Believe and I uh, appreciate Doug and all his work with that many years ago, but uh, those are floating around and have been passed out, but if you wish a copy sometime, uh, please contact the church office and, and they're available. The transition team itself is in place, and just explaining that briefly, they're here, there and have been in place to help us identify, identify our strengths and weaknesses as a church and where we need to work. They're picking up where the Vitality team left off in their evaluation, so you're not going to go back through all that process again. They're going to use that information. Their search committee and the transition team will share information in this process as they both have the same goal, and that's to find the best minister that fits this church. Uh, Reverend Richwine has interviewed 108 individuals. Uh, that takes a while. And so during these uh, first three months, he's been doing that, looking at organization, uh, getting to know each, us, each of these teams, developing and setting up the transition team. So uh, he, he's been busy doing that while performing his other pastoral duties. With the transition team now organized and the search committee, along with the consistory, looking at different church opportunities, the process is properly moving along. Now, I know, like everybody else, we want somebody yesterday. 
that could very well be a mistake. Please remember that we are engaged in evaluating this church. Don't forget that. We're evaluating this church in all different areas and its future mission as a church, its ministry role, which is vital and it is important that we do it correctly and take the necessary time so that it is done correctly. This is a process. It is not a race to find a minister. And in this process, the goal remains centered on finding the real mission of this church. That's why it is of vital importance you communicate with the transition team, Reverend Witchrun, the consistory, about the church. That was the mission of the interviewing 108 people that he had set up. Some of you, I don't know how long your interviews were, but that were not just come in, how are you, bye, see you out the door. Once the mission of this church is identified, it will greatly enhance the selection and most importantly this, the ministry of our next resident or senior pastor because they won't walk in cold turkey having an idea of trying to figure out what we are, who we are, where we're going, what it's all about and all that stuff which is tough. Which is what Stan and Jim have been doing over the last six months. So a lot of that work will be done, which will also help the search team, transition team, and consistory identify the next minister because there will be a purpose identified inside this church. So it's a different approach, but if you stop and think about it for a minute, while it may seem like it's long, it's not. It's purposeful, and it will have great benefits, we believe. Finally, a couple of other simple announcements. The FFC Sunday, class, Sunday school class is moving back into their classroom today, as the, well as the high school moving back, so we're sort of getting into the normal locations of Sunday school classes. Once we conclude today, uh, you're invited by the fellowship team, and that's, uh, I want to sit here and name everybody because I'll leave people out, but I'm going to highlight Ann and Susie for all their work with it, and I know I've left people out, but... Uh, all their work in setting that up and just the time for us to get together outside hopefully the weather cooperates and to socialize and then please remember to uh, to get on the Sunday school class we appreciate your attendance today thank you We sometimes do not appreciate our own, and uh, we need to appreciate Randy. We need to appreciate Randy and Kevin. Uh, Kevin gets here early on Sunday mornings, and he and I have some time to share, talk together. And uh, today, I threw a big curveball at him and said, "Here's the slides," and uh, usually Suzanne handles all that. So uh, appreciate Kevin, Christy, Tara, all those people who do a lot of work uh, behind the scenes that allows to open the day. Let's bow our heads. Father, in the quietness of this moment, let us take all of our worldly concerns and just set them aside for a moment. And let us open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to, uh, to take in the beauty of you and the glory of your world that you have allowed us to live in. May we be a church 
that strives to meet that which you wish is to be. And that's basically simply this, a light into a world that is definitely in need of your guidance, of your love, of your grace, and of your salvation. Be with us today. May we be truly in worship with you. Amen. Would everyone please stand for the opening song? Rise up, O Church of God, 293. Affirm our faith by the reading of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the lasting. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Let us continue with our um, scripture lesson for today. And our scripture today comes from Genesis 3, 1 through 3, and Matthew 22, <clears throat> verses 36 through 40. In Genesis 1, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did you... Did God really say you must not eat from the tree of the, in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Matthew 22. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. This ends the reading of God's holy word and scripture. Amen. Thank you, Doug. Fire heads, please. Father, we are gathered here today. We could have been other places, 
But may we pray at this point in time that we are here not out of an obligation that we feel that we uh, just need to do, but may we be here and open our hearts to be receiving your word, to be opening ourselves to you. And in that vein, may we also be a church, Father, that is striving to be that which you wish us to be. And as we go through the process of identifying our strengths and weaknesses, may we also be going through the process of identifying our own and examining ourselves so that we may be prepared to be truly your disciples in the world. And as the word itself implies, Father, the disciple comes under the word discipline, meaning that we submit ourselves to the discipline of your guidance and your commands. But we do that, Father, humbly and with a big open heart, knowing that your way is indeed the best and only way. For you created a world that is beyond our ability to actually comprehend. In our feebleness, we try to explain it away as if it's just something common. Forgive us for that sin, Father. May we open ourselves to you and truly be your church and your body. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
pray. Grace Heavenly Father, we thank you for these tithes and offerings. Please lead and guide us to use them for the betterment of your kingdom. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. I know that when uh, Doug was reading the scripture and some of you that were participating in the combined Sunday school there for a while and you saw Genesis, you went, oh my gosh, this guy's stuck in Genesis. He can't get out of it. We're out of it in, in CIA class. We're moving into the letters of Paul. But, but uh, if you were uh, enduring that punishment of being in here for the Genesis Bible study, um, I will use an expression that, that is, I think is common in the old movie Shrek when he's peeling the onion and whatever and says life is sort of like the layers of an onion. Uh, there's so many layers to the Genesis story to me. Uh, that you could just spend a lot of time. So hopefully this isn't repetitious to you. I don't believe it is. Uh, number two thing, all you guys, you guys up top doing this, if it blows up, it is not Kevin's fault. You know, right there. Uh, I brought it in on the little drive, you know, and so, okay, load it. And I use Windows, and that is a Mac machine, and they just don't like each other. And so if it blows up, just kill it, you know. But glad you're here today. Uh, and, if, and if we gather, uh, hopefully I can share some words with you that, that, that may be of uh, meaning. I'm confident that everybody in this room has seen the movie Forrest Gump. If you haven't, just, it'll, it's going to come around. It's on all the time if you haven't seen it. It's sort of like I tell all the women that I, that I know of, I said that the, the, there's two men movies you, you have to watch. You have to watch Cool Hand Luke to get any idea about men because we're really stupid, but that gives us a good insight to how stupid we are, Cool Hand Luke and Shawshank Redemption. You know, you got to watch those two flicks. you got to watch Forrest Gump, too, because that is a most unusual and fictional look at history and the events that occur in our lives and often with un unimaginable results. Here's Forrest, the football hero, a hero soldier, a shrimp boat captain, a ping pong player, and in the midst of all this stuff, he's originator of the happy face, you know, that Walmart stolen. <laughs> Even when Forrest messed up, things usually worked out for him and all the people that were around him. What an entertaining story. Yet sometimes I believe we live, or I live, with the expectations of this fictional movie, as we often act as if things should work out the way that we want them to. Today we call that an entitled mentality. But in reality, it's not a new concept. Its origin was in the Garden of Eden, with Adam and Eve. As they demonstrated the arrogance and the resentment toward authority, Combine this with a lack of humility and gratitude for the life and the blessings that they had received. It is a strange thing that we often think that our viewpoint and desires are correct. And if someone disagrees in our world today, then we must prove them wrong because we have to be right. And if that fails, then we must manipulate, ostracize, and berate them. Turn on C-SPAN and you see it in living color. Today it's even seen all over the internet. Internet, Karen, I'm sorry. With the Karens. And the guys are called Kevins. Going ballistic because something did not go the way they desired. And it can be something extremely trivial. This morning, I would like to take a look at Genesis and Matthew, the first books of the Old and the New Testament, and challenge us to examine our faith and ask, do we sometimes live like Forrest Gump? Simply believing things will go our way with a lucky and entitled mindset, or do we live a life that represents that which Christ charges us to be? As believers, I honestly think this is something that we routinely need to do and examine our own faith and hopefully today is just a little bit of a lick on a sucker on that avenue 
Adam and Eve were the highlights of God's creation. And they had specific duties to perform. They're outlined in the Bible. Identify the animals. Adam was supposed to put his thinking engaged. They were to discover and use the world around them. They were to populate the earth. And to be in an obedient relationship with God. The Bible presents God with Adam and Eve in a close and personal relationship. However, our ancestral parents listened to the tempter and their own egos as they stepped outside of God's will. Planted in these few verses is a biblical thread that appears again when Christ says in Matthew 22, verse 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. In Genesis and in Matthew, we find a godly demand. We are to look to him for direction, salvation, love, guidance, and meaning. And in following this godly demand, we will find the discipline that brings us to purpose and direction. Two of the things that we most seek and desire in life. As believers, we know that we are not perfect. And when we look deeply into ourselves, or when I look deeply into myself, I see a lot of problems. But we recognize a pattern reminiscent of Adam and Eve. As believers, we should not be adrift in an ocean of temptation and sin. And self, while bouncing around the moral spectrum, instead we are to have a faith that creates perseverance and stability, especially during difficult times. A faith uncertainty was present with Adam and Eve and unfortunately remains today. In Genesis 2, 6-7 through we find, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat fruit, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for on that day you eat of it you will surely die. Adam knew this demand. So ignorance of God's request was not a viable defense, nor can it be for us. God warned Adam, and we know that Eve knew of this demand as she later echoes it to the tempter. Both were aware of the consequences of disobedience. And we hear this same godly thread in Romans 6.23 where Paul says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Point. The Bible is consistent and insistent. Genesis 3 opens with, with Satan, working to tempt Eve by displaying the beauty of this forbidden fruit and to create a forbidden action. This story shows the nature of our sinful self as the issue is centered on our, on our desiring what we want not on the things we actually need. It is like telling a child that they can have the peanuts in this bowl and there's chocolate in this bowl. But they cannot have the chocolate-covered peanuts. That which we are denied, even when it is of little significance, dominates our thoughts. Our ego-driven self does not want to be denied something that at that particular moment in time, we desire. And we quickly, quickly rebel against any authority that denies us pleasure, passion, or position. So what is it then most desired by this young child? The chocolate-covered peanuts. As, her, as this rebellion rises from being forbidden something that is attractive, Satisfying and pleasing, like the forbidden fruit in the garden. In Genesis 3, 6, Eve shows us the steps of surrendering to temptation. These steps remain true today. There was a physical lure. The tree provided food. I've met people that seem to live life this way. I live to eat. Instead of, I eat to live. We have food channels. There was an emotional lure. 
The fruit delighted the eye. And how are we attracted with all the fashions of the world? And there was an intellectual lure. The fruit will make you wise. Eve followed these logical steps, which made her disobedience simple. She agreed with Satan telling herself and Adam that surely God would not want them to be denied something so pleasing and so profitable. These three steps make sin appear harmless, natural, and excusable. We defend ourselves through physical reasoning to satisfy our desire for something that we long for or that we hunger for, or thinking that if we gain an emotional lift, we will be happier. And even intellectually, by stating the action enhances and empowers our lives. Turn on the TV. Every commercial is centered on one of those three things, or all three of them. But once Adam and Eve displayed, excuse me, disobeyed God, a journey of human first began. The first time that God was disobeyed. The first time humans experienced shame, resulting from their own reckless behavior. The first attempt for mankind to self-cleanse, and humanity's self-help movement began. And maybe even the first religious act by the construction of fig leaves. Adam and Eve knew they were disobeying God rationalized their way around it, and after their disobedient act, they felt their sin. However, do not overlook one important fact. They completely failed to think to ask God for help. They instead attempted to solve their sin problems themselves. Instead of seeking God for assistance, they chose to hide their guilt and self-centered coverings of fig leaves, which may appear silly, but it is no more silly and no more off-target than the coverings we create to hide our sins. Adam easily and quickly develops mankind's response to sin as he states, and I'm paraphrasing here, well, you know, God, it was really Eve that made me do it. And you and I had a really good thing going until she showed up. So in many ways, even though I hate to say it, you ever have people like put that phrase in there, they really hate to say it, but they're going to say it anyway? Even though I hate to say it, it's really your fault. And Adam concludes with the greatest line that we use. You see, I'm the real victim in all of this. The victim card was played early on, and it remains a popular and preferred ploy for many people. Eve, and notice, she's in the midst of the first marital spat in history. Well, it's not my fault either. It was that wily snake, which you created, God. And that snake gave me some stories that made sense and were well-pleasing, implying that God's stories weren't as good. And just so you know, Adam did not warn me well enough. If he really loved me, he would have stopped me. All marital conflicts are presented As a brief aside, this is a topic worth a study in itself. As the first human institution created by God, marriage and family, is quickly under attack. And there's a reason that we need to be cherishing and directing our families. Adam and Eve's attempt to cover and hide their sin from God might pass as the first religious action, which I earlier stated. They performed a simple futile act as they put on their fig leaves 
or to verbalize this action, allow this. Okay, I got to cover my tracks. Keep my secrets and hide my errors so that no one knows. And then, hey, I'm good. I'm in the clear. That's me. Have you ever wondered why the first and foremost goal of God is to confess our disobedience? Probably for the same reason that I don't go to God with the heart and mind focused on confession and repentance because it's an admission of error. As we utilize the physical, emotional, and intellectual steps of our disobedience, we still think, as did Adam and Eve, we can hide our sins. While our fig leaves may be larger and more elaborate in our attempts to camouflage our sin, they are no more effective than those used by Adam and Eve. We also find in this story the beginning of God's ongoing outreach to humanity. As he asks, where are you? It is here that God's seek, save, and deliver mission moves into action. As humanity begins its destructive, self-help, selfish, ego-driven life struggle. This story shows the futility of our covering up, of attempting to be self-cleansers. Instead of us confessing, repenting, and asking God for, for forgiveness, for his grace, and for his guidance. Unfortunately, confession and repentance are not regularly in humanity's playbook. And this is the reason Christ stated in Matthew 4, 17, as Pastor Jim pointed out last week, that the first act of the gospel focuses upon our need to repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. Adam also shows us in verse 10 our great fear when he faces God saying, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Adam and need, Eve needed repentance and humility. But instead they selected their ego-driven path that was utilized in the timeless, unfortunate act of fig leaves. This is why Christ speaks so strongly about repentance and humility as being foundational blocks in our faith. If we desire to be believers accepting and acting upon the demand to love God first and to let this love direct our life's actions in all of our relationships, then having a worldly, ego-driven life fig leaf makes this impossible. While many sinful acts are easily identified, I also mentioned the fact that we can be using good leaves, maybe even worship leaves, as I earlier suggested. We may come to church, attend Bible classes, or do good deeds in the community for others, and be using these as fig leaves to simply check off the appropriate boxes and to cover our bases so that we appear righteous to others as we build a positive worldly resume in our attempt to prove to others that we are living the good life. We may pray every morning and evening, but if the prayer is simply an act of request and not one of listening for God's direction, have we simply added a re religious fig leaf trying to cover our true rebellion? We may even give money to the church. But we cannot cover our disbelieving heart if our giving is simply another fig leaf. Do we give with joy to God and to others, or do we give with a resentment, a resentful heart of rebellion, and I've got an obligation? As Adam and Eve fell with their leaves, we too cannot cover our disobedience to God. You might be actively constructing an incredibly good-looking fig leaf, but when we come face to face with God, running, covering, and hiding in shame did not work, for the, work in the garden 
and it will not work for us. When Adam and Eve's fateful day began, it was bright and perfect because they were in harmony with God and with his creation and then how quickly the world changed. To correct it, we must be willing to repent and accept the truth that God is our only true repair shop. Our fig leaves fail because they are an attempt to avoid personal accountability. But if there were no sin in the world, we would need no Savior. And if there were no judgment, then we would not need a Redeemer. But we know that there is sin and that there will be judgment. For God is a just God. The hole in our hearts is God-shaped, and all of our relationships must be built around Christ if we desire hope, purpose, and guidance. Simply stated, our worldly-centered, ego-driven fig leaves will not save us. But God can. We cannot live a Christian life chasing the latest fashion be it the newest self-improvement, self-help plan, or with religious thoughts centered on convenience, comfort, and self-empowerment. Attending church is good, but worshiping God both in and out of church should be our goal. Individually, as families, as friends, as co-workers, and then corporately as Beck's Church, we must remove the fig leaves and work toward living in a right relationship with Christ. And how do we recognize if we are accomplishing this God-centered demand? If you don't have this marked in your Bibles, take a note. What is the evidence of our love for God? We find it answered succinctly. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. The reason I say that, it's not John, 1 John. It is written, We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, sometimes the Bible's right to the point, but does not do as he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Amen.
Molly, good to see you. I was just sort of uh, thinking how I could just end this thing with a uh, thought. I, I went, came up with me the three hardest things to say. I was wrong, which means I can humbly repent. I need help. I need a Savior. And I submit because Christ Jesus is the authority in my life. Eve had three human reasons to be tempted. We have three faith-based reasons to be his disciples. And then, in this on a humorous note, when I was riding over this morning and thought, this, they, these three things came to me and said, the three hardest things to say. Yeah, okay, I got that. Then I went, no, there's one more. Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> how do you say that and who thought of how to spell that anyway? You, you, Worcestershire and wor you know, I'd hate to guess how many times, uh, many different ways, Worcestershire or however you say it is, is, is said. Uh, throw that one away, but I thought we would end with a little, maybe a little laugh. And remember, we have uh, Lemonade on Lawn. Appreciate all those involved with that. And we do have Sunday school this afternoon. Everybody's back home. Everybody's back at, back at their, their uh, normal places. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for this time together. And as we gather uh, as a church uh, in time of fellowship, may, we, may the joy that you have given us in knowing your son be, uh, be filled in our hearts, filling our conversations as we look at ourselves, look at this church, look at our community and try to decide, Father, how can we best humbly serve you? Be with us this week as we go and live in the world in which you have so graciously allowed us to inhabit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.